This podcast is intended for investment professionals only. Hi, and thank you all for taking the time to listen to our podcast. I'm Olison Bobby mason Member Proposition Director at LGIM. This International Women's Day, I'm keen to dive into one of those uncomfortable topics we don't often talk about. That's the impact of divorce on retirement outcomes. In the US, one in two first marriages end, over two in three second marriages, and nearly three quarters of third marriages, according to Forbes. In the UK, the ONS tells us that the overall divorce rate is 31.8% in 2024. Although the number does seem to be coming down in recent years, it's still a definitive theme in many people's lives. At the same time, we in the financial services industry know that to many, pensions are silent assets people don't engage with as much as we would like during their working careers. We know that women and ethnic minorities are disproportionately likely to have less of this tax advantageous benefit. But are pension assets always transparent? Can pots be forgotten about when couples divide up their assets after a marriage ends? What is the effect on women, and in particular, minority ethnic women? With these in mind, Legal and General conducted research in late 2023 among a nationally representative panel of 2,750 UK adults who were divorced. Here to discuss these pertinent issues with me today is Uche Enemchuku, ED&I champion and CEO at Nelu Solutions. Hi, I'm so happy to be here, Ali. Thank you for the invitation. If it's okay, I'll start with an introduction. So again, thank you for having me. My name is Uchain Chuku. I am, as you said, the CEO of Nailu Solutions. We are a benefits consultancy um, and training organization that specializes in inclusive benefit design and communications. So um, we are based in Chicago and we also operate out of the UK. So um, it's been great meeting you, Ali, and other members of the retirement community um, in the UK. So thank you for having me, and I look forward to this discussion. Delighted to have you with us today, Uche. So let's start by breaking down some of the stats on the impact of divorce on women versus men. Let's have a quick look at the cost. It's pretty extensive. In the year following a divorce, women see their annual income fall by 41% compared to men at 21%. That's shocking, but perhaps not surprising. So I guess my first question is, why do you think that is? Ah, that is a that is a very broad question. So I'm trying going to try to make this um, as um, as concise as possible. And it's good that it's a broad question because we have to really walk through. Um, the issues. So the way that that number, that 41% um, is a very high number, but like you said, Ollie, it's not shocking. And why isn't it shocking? Because as women, as two women sitting here and speaking to each other, right, um, we know that women, we take on um, some, some significant responsibilities um, in marriage, um, in marriage, right? Um, and in raising a family. Um, and I like to think about it kind of in three phases, especially with respect with respect to divorce, right? Um, and the numbers that you mentioned, the stats that you mentioned. Um, the first phase, right? Number one is, you know, the time when a woman is in a marriage and um, is raising a family, right? So before divorce. So women tend to be the ones that sacrifice their income and their time, right, um, for purposes of raising a family and caring for other dependents, right? Um, and in that, you're making um, a very, a, a basically a systemic, right, sacrifice, meaning that that sacrifice really follows you through the rest of your life, right? Um, with respect to having a lower income, with respect to um, being out of the workforce for longer, which lowers your income and then lowers your ability to um, to contribute to your retirement scheme um, consistently and sufficiently, right? Um, and then there's the time, the second phase, right, of, uh, of life for someone who gets divorced is, um, the period of time when you're in the divorce um, and 
right? And after the divorce, right? So your income goes down by, for women, by almost more than half, um, as you mentioned. Um, and then on top of that, right, you are now, you've now moved from a two-person head of ho- heads of household to a one-person head of household um, and likely have taken on um, custody or at least partial custody um, of children and likely remain the main caregiver for other dependents, right? So your income has not only um, fallen significantly, um, but you're also taking on the um, the majority of the cost, right, um, of caregiving, right? And it's not just the financial cost of caregiving, it's also the time. <laughs> it's also the time. So as a single parent, um, having to sacrifice income and then take the time, right, um, to yeah, be the sole caregiver. That, I guess there's that point you mentioned, and we refer to it in the UK as that sandwich generation. So you pick up the childcare for your children. You then find towards the latter stages of your parents' lives as they become more elderly, you're also picking up those caring responsibilities. So it's yeah. something we're absolutely live to as an industry. And um, it, yeah, it'd be great to get into a bit more about the caregiving element of that with you a little bit later as well. So um, so then that takes us to the third phase, right? Um, and the third phase is um, phase is in, in actual retirement or the retirement years. We know that the data shows both in the U.S. and here that women are more likely to retire in poverty. And it's for all the reasons we just mentioned, right? Um, the reality is if you go back to phase one and see how it impacts phase two and how it impacts phase three, um, you see that that initial um, income sacrifice, right, um, for purposes of raising a family, et cetera, that rolls into not only um, your retirement accounts, um, but it also rolls into your private retirement accounts, right? But it also rolls into um, your state pension, right? So there's a lot to think about in those three phases for us as an industry, right? And really paying attention to those three phases and addressing each one. Thanks, Uche. So as with many other areas of pensions, there's an awareness piece that pensions are an asset in the divorce. There's another shocking statistic, though. Nearly a quarter, 24% of women, waive their right to their partner's pension as part of their divorce. What are your thoughts? That one shocked me. That makes me sad, to be honest. Um, it's it's a high number. It's a high percentage. Um, so, huh, so just thinking about thinking about the UK um, related to the US and other places, right? We know that um, we know that women taking full advantage of their rights and divorce. Um, is inhibited by a number of different things, right? Um, and in some places, um, more so than others. Um, so in the US, for example, um, a woman's ability, right, and their rights to really push for fairness, right, in retirement accounts um, during divorce, it's really a state by state issue. And what tends to happen is, as retirement scheme administrators, right? Um, we then um, have all these requirements, right? Around um, around uh, qualified domestic relations orders and all of these different things that create some barriers for women to really get their fair share, right? So it's not only the state policy impact, but it's also the requirements that we have around it, right? Um, and so those are areas that are very real and that we can help women um, work through. We as an industry can help women work through. And it's the same in the UK, right? You don't have your state by state laws like we have in the US, 50 states. Um, but there are, all, there are regional considerations for sure. Um, so I think from a policy perspective, um, there are things that can be done to ensure that women automatically receive their fair share of retirement accounts. I also think that we really have to do a better job of um, educating and empowering women around 
um, retirement accounts. First, they have to know that they exist, right? Um, and they'll know that they exist if they are actively contributing to their own retirement accounts, right? Um, so we have to educate them to really understand, hey, this is important. Your retirement, um, the amount that you have in your retirement account jointly um, and individually will make a difference in your phase three, your life in retirement. Um, and we also have to advocate for women directly, right? So we talked about policy. Um, we talked about education. And then thirdly, as um, the retirement industry, as the benefits industry, we can do a better job of talking about retirement accounts generally and making sure that we're tying the talk right around retirement to other benefits, right, that employers provide so that we are taking more of a holistic approach and we're talking to women in a more holistic manner, right, about retirement accounts so that they feel empowered, um, they have the information that they need to really look at their situation in, in divorce more holistically um, and in that push for their fair share um, of retirement assets. And I think that point you make about looking at things more holistically is so key here, isn't it? Because 24 percent of people um, just waiving their rights to pension. And I wonder mm -hmm. whether that plays into that point you made earlier about women, you know, being the care, the natural carer. You know, mm -hmm. you want to make the divorce as um, seamless as possible. You know, you don't mm -hmm. want to have to be too much change for your children if you have children. So the tendency yeah. might be to try and keep the home, keep the children in their same safe space. And therefore, yes. pension doesn't seem as important, whereas it can actually build up to be a very, very large asset. Exactly, exactly. It is the, like we talked about before, just the time and cognitive space, right, to deal with all of it. And then the societal expectations that we put on women to be agreeable, right? To be agreeable and to also just, really be the ones to lean in on um, taking care of the children and taking care of the household, right? So um, so again, being able to kind of take a holistic approach and really talk to women about, hey, here are caregiving benefits that are available, right? Here are all menopause benefits that we offer. Here are benefits around dependent education. Here are all these different things that can help a woman kind of land safely from a divorce, right? So thinking about all those things. So totally, Ollie. Now I want to delve a little into Elgin's findings from our ethnicity pension gap research. So people from minority ethnic communities in the UK were less likely to have a substantial pension pot versus white British peers. They were also more likely to have a role as a caregiver, which required them to take a step back from work. It'd be great to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, and also it's it's really significant, especially in the context of divorce, because there's, as a Nigerian woman, Nigerian-American woman, um, who also spends a lot of time in the UK, um, the reality is that culture is real, right? And there are cultural aspects to divorce and there are cultural aspects to responsibilities in divorce, right? So you mentioned the stats on um, caregiving, right, for ethnic minority women. Um, as a Nigerian woman, I can tell you that that is true. That is accurate. It tracks, right? So the reality is, is that we have to take into consideration intersectionality. So um, I'm not just a woman. I am also a Nigerian woman, right? I'm a Nigerian woman who is also, who is Black, <laughs> right? I'm Nigerian and I'm Black. So we have to take into consideration intersectionality and the impacts of those identities um, on our finances, right? The impacts of those identities on our retirement accounts, the impacts of those identities on life changes like divorce, right? So we can't talk what this data, this really great data that your report, um, that your report found, right? What this really great data shows um, is that we can't talk to all women the same way. So we can't take a one size fits all approach with women. It will not work. We have to have adequate representation of um, 
women from ethnic minority backgrounds. We have to hear their voices, their challenges, um, and their barriers so that we can talk to them directly and make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. Thanks, Uche. So I absolutely agree that intersectionality is key. I'm also a Nigerian woman, and I strongly <laughs> believe that cultural considerations are really important when we think about how we engage with people around their finances and pensions. So now for the tricky part, how can we solve this problem? We know that this isn't a problem that individuals can fix by themselves, so we all have a responsibility. And what do you think we can do in this space? To your point around this isn't a problem that individuals can face themselves. These are systemic issues, right? So there are different pieces of the system, right? And all pieces of the system have to interact holistically um, to address these issues. Are we going to fix this problem tomorrow? No. But we can take significant steps, right, to improving um, to improving women's um, women's ability to save, right? Women's ability to um, have parity with men um, on in their finances and in their retirement accounts, right? Um, so I would say I would look at the three phases again, right? So thinking about the first phase before retirement, um, all those caregiving responsibilities, the time taken out of work, all those different pieces, um, we need to think about that from a policy perspective, from a broader policy perspective, um, in terms of um, paid leave, um, in terms of what does it, making sure that a part time women working part time are still able, right, to be automatically enrolled. Um, and if that's not the case, then doing a better job of educating women from a policy perspective, right, um, to make sure that they get engaged with their retirement um, schemes. Um, so holistically, right, policy um, that touches caregiving that touches leave and that touches um, retirement schemes, right? And then the second piece of that, the second phase, I should say, at um, at divorce um, and after divorce, um, that, that really is on us, I would say, as an industry and on employers as well, um, to really collaborate to make sure that we are supporting women at the time of divorce, right? Um, at the time of divorce and after. So that means really paving the way for them to land safely, right? So making sure that we have adequate caregiving benefits and we are when we are talking about it, right? Talking about caregiving benefits to them at the same time that we're talking about all the other benefits that they have available to them, including retirement accounts, right? Because if they are supported in other ways and there's more capacity, there's more time and resources that they can take to, one, really pay attention to what's happening with their retirement accounts, accounts um, really understand what's happening with their retirement accounts, and then also advocate for themselves. Um, and when I talk about adv advocating for themselves, it ties back to that holistic approach to benefits because as employers, we have pro we have EAPs, employee assistance plans, and all these different things that can actually provide some legal guidance, right? So if a woman just knows you have a right, you have a right to ask about and advocate for advocate <laughs> for um, your fair share of retirement accounts, then they're more likely to do it. So um, collaboration, taking a holistic approach at the time of um, divorce. Ollie, you were going to say something, please. I was, Uche, because it was just very interesting that you mentioned employee assistance programs, because let's be honest, divorce is going to be a very stressful time for women, yeah. um, men as well. But, you know, we're talking about women here. So, you know, thinking about those employee assistance programs as well, maybe the support around that that would be available to women and your views on that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, employee assistance plans or programs, they're, they're different, right? But many, all of them um, include um, mental health support. So mental health counseling. Um, I have not been through a divorce, but I have seen, and my understanding is that going through a divorce is one of the most stressful things that you'll experience in your life, right? 
So having that um, mental and emotional support, right, um, through an employee assistance program is so critical. We know that these programs are underutilized, right? And they shouldn't be because they can be so helpful um, to to members, to um, women in particular, like you said, we're talking about women today, but they can be so helpful, especially in the context of divorce, everything from the mental health aspects of it to also the legal guidance that you can get, right, through um, an EAP. Um, they're also just navigation, getting connected to the services that you, the resource that, resources that you may need, um, including caregiver, child care and caregiving resources, right? So just being able to talk about something like um, an EAP, right, together with you know, retirement schemes and retirement accounts, if we can take that holistic approach, I think it would, would really make a huge difference for women. But it's up to us to make sure that we're communicating these things well. So it's about education, awareness and policy. So thanks for a really interesting conversation, Uche. And thank you to all of our listeners. For more ideas about redressing pension inequalities, please visit the Elgin blog. Please do subscribe to Elgin Talks for more conversations about retirement, economics and financial markets. As a reminder, this podcast is intended for investment professionals only and shouldn't be shared with a non-professional audience. This podcast should not be taken as an invitation to deal in legal and general investments. Any views expressed during this recording belong to the individuals and are based on market conditions at the time of the recording and do not reflect the views of legal and general investment management. Forward-looking statements are, by their nature, subject to significant risks and uncertainties and are based on internal forecasts and assumptions and should not be relied upon. Where individual stocks are mentioned, these do not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any security and are for illustrative purposes only. Legal and General Investment Management Limited is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. For full terms and conditions, please visit our website. To find more content, you can check us out on Twitter, LinkedIn and our website. Copyright 2023 Legal and General Investment Management Limited. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, including photocopying and recording without the written permission of the publishers. This material is issued by Legal and General Investment Management Asia Limited, the License Corporation BBB 488, regulated by the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission for professional investors only.